Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. In the short life of this series, I have seen the atrocities of mankind, ranging from centuries ago to as recent as just a few months. Sadly, the making of monsters doesn't seem to have an end in sight. What sets today's superstar apart would be the great lengths he went to to prepare and secure the deaths of countless. Although he confessed to killing 27, only nine were ever confirmed. However, it is believed that the real number is well over 250 due to the witness accounts of so many entering but never leaving. H. H. Holmes, born Herman Webster Mudgett in New Hampshire, the son of Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. The family was descended from among the first settlers to the area. He grew up with a father who was a strict disciplinarian and was often bullied as a child. He claimed that as a child, he had been forced by other students to view and touch a human skeleton after they found out about his fear of the doctor. The bullies had initially brought him there to scare him, but instead, he was fascinated. Herman graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School in 1884. While enrolled, he stole bodies from the school laboratory, disfiguring the corpses and claiming that the people had been accidentally killed. Mudgett then collected insurance money from policies which he had taken out on each one. After graduating, he moved to Chicago to practice pharmacy. He also began to engage in a number of shady businesses, real estate, promotional deals, all under the name of H.H. H. Holmes. On July 8, 1878, Holmes married Clara Lovering of Alton, New Hampshire. He also married Murda Belknap in Minneapolis, Minnesota on January 28, 1887, making him a bigamist. He had a daughter with Belknap named Lucy Theodate Holmes, born on July 4th in 1889 in Illinois. The family of three resided in the upscale Chicago suburb of Wilmette. Although Holmes spent most of his time in the city tending to business, Holmes filed a petition for divorce from his first wife after marrying his second, but it was never finalized. He married his third wife, Georgiana Yoke, on January 9th 1894. He also had a relationship with Julia Smythe, the wife of Ned Connor, a one-time employee who later fled Chicago. Julia became one of Holmes' victims. While in Chicago, Holmes came across Dr. E. S. Holton's drugstore. It was located at the corner of Wallace and 63rd Street, in the neighborhood of Inglewood. Holton was suffering from cancer while his wife minded the store. Through his charm, Holmes got a job there and then manipulated her into letting him purchase the store. The agreement was that she could still live in the upstairs apartment even after Holton died. Once he did, Holmes murdered Mrs. Holton and told people she was visiting relatives in California. As people started asking questions as to when she would be coming back, he elaborated the lie and told them that she loved it so much in California that she decided to stay. Holmes purchased a lot across the street from the drugstore where he built his three-story, block-long castle, as it was dubbed by those in the neighborhood. 
It was opened as a hotel for the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, with part of the structure used as commercial space. The ground floor of the castle contained, aside from Holmes's own relocated drugstore, various shops, a jeweler, for example, while the upper two floors contained his personal office, as well as a maze of over 100 windowless rooms with doorways that would open to brick walls, oddly angled hallways, stairways to nowhere, doors that could only be opened from the outside, and a host of other strange and labyrinthine constructions. Holmes had repeatedly changed builders during the initial construction of the castle to ensure that he only fully understood the design of the house, thereby decreasing the chances of any of them reporting it to the police. Over a period of three years, Holmes selected female victims from among his employees, many of whom were required as a condition of employment to take out life insurance policies, for which Holmes would pay the premiums but also be the beneficiary. He would then proceed to torture and kill them. Some were locked in soundproof bedrooms fitted with glass lines. That permitted him to asphyxiate them at any time. Some victims were locked in a huge bank vault near his office. He could sit and listen as they screamed, panicked, and eventually suffocated due to the fact that the vault was soundproof. The victims' bodies went by a secret chute to the basement, where some were meticulously dissected, stripped of flesh, crafted into skeleton models, and then sold to medical schools. Some of the bodies were cremated or placed in lime pits for destruction. Holmes also had two giant furnaces, as well as pits of acid, bottles of various poisons, and even a stretching rack. Through the connections he had gained in medical school, he was able to sell skeletons and organs with little difficulty. Holmes picked one of the most remote rooms in the castle to perform hundreds of illegal abortions. Some of his patients died as a result, and their corpses were also processed and the skeletons sold. Following the World's Fair, with creditors closing in and the economy in a general slump, Holmes left Chicago. He next appeared in Fort Worth, Texas, where he had inherited property from two railroad heiress sisters one of whom he promised marriage, and both of whom he murdered. There, he sought to construct another castle along the lines of his Chicago operation. However, he soon abandoned this project as well, finding the law enforcement climate in Texas inhospitable. He continued to move about the United States and Canada, and while it seems likely that he continued to kill the only bodies discovered which date from this period are those of his close business associate and three of the associate's children. In July of 1894, Holmes was arrested and briefly incarcerated for the first time for a horse swindle that ended in St. Louis. He was promptly bailed out, but while in jail, he struck up a conversation with a convicted train robber named Marion Hedgepeth, who was serving a 25-year sentence. Holmes had concocted a plan to bilk an insurance company out of $20,000 by taking out a policy on himself and then faking his own death. Holmes promised Hedgepeth a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who could be trusted. He was directed to Colonel Jephtha Howe, the brother of a public defender, and Howe found Holmes' plan to be brilliant. Holmes' plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious 
and refused to pay. Holmes did not press his claim. Instead, he concocted a similar plan with his associate, Peitzel. Peitzel had agreed to fake his own death so that his wife could collect on the $10,000 policy, which she was to split with Holmes and a shady attorney, Howe. The scheme was to take place in Philadelphia. Peitzel was to be an inventor under the name B. F. Perry, and then be killed and disfigured in a lab explosion. Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Peitzel. Holmes then killed Peitzel. Although some have argued that Peitzel, an alcoholic and chronic depressive, might in fact have committed suicide. Forensic evidence presented at Holmes' later trial, however, showed that chloroform was administered after Peitzel's death, presumably to fake suicide. Holmes proceeded to collect on the policy on the basis of the genuine Peitzel corpse. Holmes then went on to manipulate Peitzel's wife into allowing three of her five children to stay in his custody. The eldest and baby remained with Mrs. Peitzel. He traveled with the children through northern United States and into Canada. Simultaneously, he escorted Mrs. Peitzel along a parallel route, all the while using various aliases and lying to Mrs. Peitzel concerning her husband's death, claiming that he was hiding in South America, as well as lying to her about the true whereabouts of her other children. They were often only separated by a few blocks. A Philadelphia detective had tracked Holmes, finding the decomposed bodies of two of the Peitzel children in Toronto. He then followed Holmes to Indianapolis, where Holmes had rented a cottage. He was reported to have visited a local pharmacy to purchase the drugs he used to kill the remaining Peitzel child that was in his care, and a repair shop to sharpen the knives he used to chop up the body before he burned it. The boy's teeth and bits of bone were discovered in the home's chimney. In 1894, the police were tipped off by his former cellmate, Marion Hedgepeth, who Holmes had neglected to pay off as promised for his help in providing Howe. Holmes' escapade ended when he was finally arrested in Boston on November 17, 1894 after being tracked there from Philadelphia by the Pinkertons. He was held on an outstanding warrant for horse theft in Texas, as the authorities had little more than suspicion at this point and Holmes appeared poised to flee the country in the company of his unsuspecting third wife. After the custodian for the castle informed police that he was never allowed to clean the upper floors, police began a thorough investigation over the course of the next month, uncovering Holmes' efficient methods of committing murders and then disposing of the corpses. A fire of mysterious origin consumed the building on August 19, 1895, and the site is currently occupied by a U.S. post office building. The number of his victims has typically been estimated between 20 and 100, and even as high as 250, based upon missing persons reports of the time, as well as the testimony of Holmes' neighbors, who reported seeing him accompany unidentified young women into his hotel, young women whom they never saw leaving. The discrepancy in numbers can perhaps be best attributed to the fact that a great many people came to Chicago to see the World's Fair, but for one reason or another, never came home. The only verified number is 27, although police had commented that some of the bodies in the basement were so badly dismembered and decomposed that it was difficult to tell how many bodies were actually there. Holmes' victims were primarily women and primarily blonde, but included some men and children. While Holmes sat in prison in Philadelphia, 
Not only did the Chicago police investigate his operations in that city, but the Philadelphia police began to try to unravel the whole Pitesell situation. In particular, what had happened to the three missing children. Philadelphia detective Frank Geyer was given the task of finding out. His quest for the children, like the search of Holmes Castle, received wide publicity. His eventually discovery of their remains essentially sealed Holmes' fate, at least in the public's mind. Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Peitzel and confessed, following his conviction to 27 murders in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto, and six attempted murders. Holmes was paid $7,500 by Hearst's papers in exchange for his confession. He gave various contradictory accounts of his life, initially claiming innocence, and later that he was possessed by Satan. His facility for lying has made it difficult for researchers to ascertain any truth on the basis of his statements. On May 7th, 1896, Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing Prison, also known as the Philadelphia County Prison. Until the moment of his death, Holmes remained calm and amiable, showing very few signs of fear, anxiety, or depression. Holmes' neck did not snap immediately. Instead, he died slowly, twitching for over 15 minutes before being pronounced dead at 20 minutes after the trap was sprung. He requested that he be buried in concrete so that no one could ever dig him up and dissect his body, as he had dissected so many before him. This request was granted. On New Year's Eve 1910, Marion Hedgepeth, who had been pardoned for informing on Holmes, was shot and killed by a police officer during a holdup at a Chicago saloon. On March 7, 1914, a story in the Chicago Tribune reported the death of the former caretaker of the murder castle, Pat Quinlan. Quinlan had committed suicide by taking strychnine, and the paper reported that his death meant the mystery of the Holmes castle would remain unexplained. Quinlan's surviving relatives claimed that he had been haunted for several months before his death and that he could never sleep. Many monsters have come and gone, but few throughout history have purposely made entrapments for their victims like Holmes did, and I pray that they never do. If you have a serial killer you would like to see featured here, please contact me through any of my social media links or email me at duchessdark676 at gmail.com. See you next time.